It is therefore now time for question period. Yes. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Uh, first of all, let me say congratulations to you. Congratulations on your new ministry, and, uh, and I know that you're well aware that home care providers are taking your government to court. For heaven's sake, Speaker, the VON is suing the government. The Liberals are putting home care patients at risk with their SEIU-backed provincial agency. The application for judicial review says, quote, the decision to introduce an untested home care delivery model centered on an agency with no track record jeopardizes Ontario home care patients. And the organizations fighting this government account for 95 percent of the services in the system. Speaker, why continue the fight? Will the new minister's first order of business be to scrap this SEIU-backed agency? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the members of this House uh, uh, for congratulating me on this new role. Uh, I uh, know that I have very big uh, shoes to fill in following the footsteps of uh, former Minister Hoskins, but I assure every member that I will. I will do my very best uh, uh, to uh, fulfill the role as Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And uh, in response to the member's question, I would also like to say that we are very conscious of the wonderful work that is done by our frontline staff in health care, uh, those PSWs and those support staff that support uh, uh, some of our most vulnerable people in this province Answer. in terms of their needs for home care. And uh, in the supplementary, I will address his question more directly. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it doesn't sound like the new minister is going to scrap the plan, but, Speaker, as I stated, the VON is suing the government of Ontario. In June of 2016, SEIU Healthcare started lobbying the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care to adopt this exact model for personal support service. In the same month, the former minister gave a speech at an SEIU convention in Detroit, bragging about the government's strong relationship with this group. In that speech, the minister stated that with the advice of SEIU, his ministry was seeking a, quote, common employer for care providers. Mr. Speaker, are the Liberals undertaking this massive change in care delivery solely at the request of SEIU? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And on this side of the House, we certainly believe that Ontarians should have the option to have more control and choice over their home care services. And that's why our government is launching a new self-directed care model that patients could opt into. It would provide home care clients with funding to purchase services in their care plan or to employ people to provide these services. And so what we believe is that there will be a small group of patients with chronic long-term care needs where they want an especially strong relationship with their care provider. Here, here. We know that continuity of care for the elderly when it comes to home care is a very important aspect of the care plan. Uh, we know that our frontline workers provide not only physical support, but very importantly, that emotional support over Thank the long term. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. In November of last year, the CBC reported on the cozy relationship between the Liberal Party and SEIU Healthcare, and that included past. Liberal Party President Mike Spitali, the senior lobbyist for SEIU. The Ministry of Health has no track record employing PSW and has never directly provided this type of care. The government set up this agency with no consultation and no explanation of how it will benefit our most vulnerable. This makes it painfully obvious that this agency is, up, is set up solely to benefit the SEIU. 
Mr. Speaker, are the Liberals risking the service that Ontario's most vulnerable depend on in order to further, further their political relationship? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, our self-directed care agency will help individuals with the navigation process that allows both the PSW and the client to focus on what is important, and that is the care. This is a model that has been very successfully implemented in other jurisdictions, such as Washington, California, Australia, Germany, France, and Scotland. And we will be slowly implementing this model to ensure that it, re it meets our goals of excellent care for our very vulnerable seniors and others with chronic conditions. Our government has supported uh, PSWs through major investments. We delivered on our commitment to raise the new base wage for publicly funded PSWs to $16.50. We also created the $10 million PSW training Answer. fund, which has supported training and education to PSWs working in home and community care. More to do, but definitely on the right track, Mr. Both sides have indicated to me that you want to pick up where you left off yesterday. I will too. You know what that means. New question, the member from Bruce Gray. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and congratulations, Minister. After 14 years, after 14 years of inadequate investments in long-term care, your government has forced municipalities to fill bigger and bigger funding gaps. This means local property taxpayers are footing more of the operating costs, about $300 million every year, and sadly, the number keeps going up. Meanwhile, your government hasn't so much as kept up with inflationary increases in long-term care. Minister, will you stop this egregious downloading? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite uh, for the question. Uh, great to have you as my critic again. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm very familiar with the long-term care uh, homes in this province. As in my former capacity as the Commissioner of Health Services for York Region, I had the responsibility for the administration of the two municipal homes in York Region, the Newmarket Health Centre and the Maple Health Centre. And so I'm very conscious of the issue of long-term care funding. And of course, our government has been increasing funding in really a, quite a dramatic way over the last number of years. We certainly believe that every Ontarian deserves to grow old with dignity in a safe, secure, and compassionate environment. And so we've always Answer. made it clear that support for long-term care is important, and that's why we've continued to make critical investments in this sector. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Over the holidays and into the new year, Seaforth and Clinton hospitals were filled to capacity, in part due to lack of long-term care beds. Staff, patients and families alike tried their very best to deal with this difficult situation. Speaker, they all deserve better. So through you to the minister, I ask, what is the minister going to do to alleviate the need for long-term care beds in rural Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, and so I'd like to elaborate on what we've been doing over the last number of years. First of all, funding for long-term care homes has increased by $348 million, or 9% since 2013. Our investment in long-term care homes increased by $80.5 million this year alone. We've opened 10,000 new long-term care beds and redeveloped 13,500 long-term care beds since 2003. And we've announced that we will be opening 5,000 new long-term care beds over the next four years, as well as providing 15 million more hours of nursing, personal support, and therapeutic care annually for residents in long-term care homes. And this is part of our 10-year plan to create more than 30,000 new New beds over the next decade work. No question. The member from Niagara West 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the, minister, the new Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. As a beautiful and welcoming place, Niagara has seen an enormous influx of retirees that shows no signs of stopping. According to Region of Niagara numbers, from now until 2031, seniors 65 years and older will account for 60 per cent of our population growth. Senior after senior in my riding has expressed concern about the lack of long-term care capacity in Niagara. Right now, the average wait time for a bed in the Niagara Peninsula is close to four years. This is almost twice the provincial wait time of two years. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has not built new beds in my riding since Woodlands of Sunset was completed in 2004. That's over a decade ago. Will the minister today commit to building more long-term care beds in the Niagara region? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I've certainly talked about all the investments that we've made and that we continue to propose to make. Uh, so now I'd like to turn to what we know about uh, 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 the opposition position on this question. We now know that four of their leadership candidates have committed to absolutely no action on climate change, and six the commitments in their People's Guarantee platform were largely funded by. I would ask the minister to stick to government policy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm just trying to show a contrast between what we're proposing to uh, some of the comments made across the way. Um, basically, what we're hearing from the opposition is that they have no plan to increase any of the long-term care homes that we have uh, asked for applications yes, for. We have a, now a proposal call for applications, which will be closing very soon, and we will be announcing the Thank successful you. applicants. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Prem uh, Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the acting premier. Ontario frontline healthcare workers, many of them are here today with us are some of the most talented and dedicated people I know. But healthcare providers who work in our long-term care homes are being asked to care for our parents, our grandparents, frail elderly people with fewer support from this Liberal government than ever before. Why is this Premier standing by and doing nothing while our long-term care system fails both the dedicated workers and the frail residents needing care. Thank you. Acting Premier. Well, Speaker, uh, first of all, uh, I, wa I want to welcome all the members of uh, QP who are here in the House today. They are, uh, as we all know, a very hard uh, uh, working members of our community, working uh, in a long-term care uh, sector. Speaker, just this morning, I had the opportunity to uh, sit, had a sit down downstairs with uh, some of the QP members from Ottawa who, who work in different communities like in Ottawa South and uh, Ottawa Orléans and to hear directly from, uh, from them the kind of challenges uh, they're, uh, they're seeing. And Speaker, as a government, I uh, assured them that uh, our government has a plan to ensure that we have more long-term care beds uh, uh, in our communities. Uh, speaker, as, uh, as, as you know, as the government has uh, announced additional investments in creating uh, 5,000 new long-term care beds over the next four years. Uh, and also, Speaker, our commitment uh, to increase. You're not helping. Finish, please. I speak also our commitment to increase the numbers of hours of cares uh, uh, that is required to appropriately uh, uh, help our seniors who live in long-term care uh, uh, settings. Speaker, speaker, there's nothing more important to look Answer. after our elderly, our parents, our grandparents. They're the ones who have worked hard to build this great society uh, that we live in, and we owe it to them Thank you. to provide proper and appropriate care. Supplementary. To them. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario used to have a legislative minimum hours of hands-on care but this Liberal government abolished it, and since then, there is no laws in Ontario that guarantees the amount of care that the seniors in our long-term care homes should get. Right. As it stands right now, we have some very good homes in Ontario, but we also have many, many seniors who are not getting the care they deserve. We have many frontline health care workers running off their feet, trying to do the best they can, working short shift after shift after shift. If the Premier asks 
the incredible, dedicated long-term care workers that are in the house with us right now, whether the residents get enough individual care, she would hear a resounding no. They would tell the Premier that we need a minimum standard of four hours of hands-on care, Question. and we've been needing it for a long time. So why hasn't the Premier done it? Uh, Speaker, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do want to assure the member opposite that certainly on this side of the House, we appreciate the wonderful work that is done by our frontline staff, and uh, in particular. Uh, we know that members of QP are here and uh, uh, need to uh, have the good work acknowledged at every opportunity. So we have talked about the 15 million more hours of nursing, personal support and therapeutic care annually for residents in long-term care homes, and this will increase hours of care to an average of four hours per day per resident. But we're doing a lot more in terms of other supplementary uh, areas of care. Uh, because we are absolutely committed to providing resident-centered care and investing in people who support our residents each and every day. So, what we are doing is that we're providing additional Answer. staffing through targeted streams, including $18.5 million per year uh, invested under the High Intensity Needs Fund Thank claims. You. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Those good people traveled a long distance to come here today to deliver one message. We need a legislated four hours minimum standard of hands-on care. Nothing else will do. The government has chosen to sweep the problem under the rug. We've seen understaffing going worse. We've need, uh, facilities needed to be updated. We've seen wait time increase by 270 percent, and the list of people waiting for long-term care now sits at 33,000 people. Years after years, the, the Liberal government was told four hours of hands-on care was not necessary. We are already doing it, they say, although the body of evidence and the frontline workers will tell us that four hours of hands-on care is exactly what we need. It is time Question. to care, Minister. Minister. Why? Don't we have four hours of hands-on care? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I want to make it very clear that delivering resident-centered care means all licensees are responsible for providing appropriate levels of staffing based on the individual and changing care and safety needs for all residents at all times. In other words, individuals get the care that they need, and we are increasing the hours of care to an average of four hours per day per resident. And some of these ancillary uh, uh, areas of assistance. One of the others that I think is of extreme importance is an additional $10 million for behavioral supports for specialized services for residents with cognitive impairments who are exhibiting challenging and complex behaviors. We know that in many long-term facilities uh, this is an issue. So this is bringing our government's base funding to $64 million. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Your question, the member from London Fanshawe. My question is to the Acting Premier. In her 2017 annual report, Ontario's Auditor General criticized the Liberal government for not providing enough information to the public about the performance of individual long-term care homes. In January, we learned through the media reports that the Premier and her Minister of Health are keeping a secret list of long-term care homes that they consider medium or high risk for Ontario seniors. Families with a loved one in care and the frontline health care workers who care for them are now being left to wonder if their loved ones, their moms, their dad, is in a facility that the ministry calls itself high risk. Will the Premier release the list immediately? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And of course, 
As we've said so many times, all residents living in Ontario long-term care homes deserve to be cared for in a safe, secure and compassionate environment. And our government is absolutely committed to ensuring their safety and well-being through a rigorous inspection system and a regulatory framework that we are continuously working to improve. Every long-term care home in Ontario undergoes a comprehensive resident quality inspection each year to ensure they are in compliance with the long-term care Care Homes Act. When uh, there's a complaint, there will be an unannounced inspection also. The results from every inspection are posted online for the public to see, as well as in long-term care homes. And we're actively working to provide even more information online, which will be available Answer. in the very near future. We're also enhancing our oversight through the Strengthening Quality and Accountability for Patients Act to ensure all operators Thank are you. addressing concerns promptly. Thank Supplementary. You. According to the Auditor General, about 10 per cent of Ontario long-term care homes are high risk. A home's risk level is determined by its record to comply with laws that govern long-term care. Why does the Premier think people living in these homes and the frontline staff who take care of them don't have a right to know if they are at risk? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, as I've already said, we do inspect very thoroughly. We're working to provide more information online. It'll be available in the very near future, and it will include specifics related to the performance of individual homes in relation to other homes in the province. So we are doing a number of uh, things through the Strengthening Quality and Accountability for Patients Act. I've just described some, but we're also partnering with the Michener Institute on a personal support worker registry that will improve transparency for patients and families. We have a comprehensive plan to increase safety in our long-term care homes. Mr. Thank you. Final Speaker, what New Democrats want for Ontario is zero homes to be on a high-risk high list. We want the long-term care system fixed and for every home to be a safe, caring place. But this Liberal government has refused to take a serious look at long-term care system with a broad public find and fix inquiry. The Liberal government won't show Ontarians the list, and it's pretty clear the government is not taking action to fix the problems in long-term care. Why are the Premier and the government continually sweeping the problems on long-term care under the rug? Uh, well, it appears that our goals are exactly the same, because uh, obviously on this side of the House we are committed to the safety of the residents living in our long-term care homes, and this is why we have taken so many measures to strengthen the quality and the accountability uh, for the uh, residents living in their homes. And uh, as we continue, there's always more work to be done. We're always open to uh, positive ideas for improvement. But uh, I think that the measures that... Finish, please, Minister. So we've made so many changes uh, to enhance our oversight system, and uh, we are also increasing Answer. financial penalties for home operators with recurring care and safety concerns that are not being addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Stormont, Dundas, South Langari. Thank you, Speaker, to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I would like to congratulate the minister on taking on a new challenge, and we all know that this government has created many challenges. The ministry numbers do not add up. They state that in my region is oversupplied with long-term care beds beyond 2030. Yet our residents already face long wait times and our seniors' population will, be, will double during that time. Moreover, once a patient is assigned to a bed, they're confronted with a broken system. Chronic underfunding leaves less than six minutes for our overworked PSWs to complete a patient's morning routine including the highlighted weekly bath. Which fantasy world does this ministry live in? When can we expect the fair and realistic funding required to give our seniors the care they truly deserve? 
Question. Thank you, Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, perhaps I need to reiterate all the investments that, uh, in fact, our government has made in the long-term care system. We know that our population is living longer and uh, developing care needs that are becoming increasingly complex. And that's precisely why our government has increased funding for long-term care homes by $80.5 million this year. And we've almost doubled the funding since 2003. We have committed to the average of four uh, hours per day of care to residents so that they do receive the high quality care and access to supports that they need. And uh, I'm sure uh, the member opposite will recognize that the behavioral supports that I've been speaking about, which I have observed in a home in my riding that cares for those Answer. with uh, Alzheimer's, is uh, ensuring excellent quality uh, for the most vulnerable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary, the Minister from Central Gray. Thank you, and uh, back to the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And as a former Minister of Health, I want to extend my condolences to the new Minister of Health. <laughs> Minister, uh, my offices are flooded on a, on a regular basis, as you can imagine, with inquiries from people seeking help either finding a bed in a long-term care home or assessing a personal, accessing a personal support worker. One recent example is a 57-year-old man suffering from Alzheimer's. Right now, he's sitting in a retirement home waiting for a bed in long-term care. His wife works full-time. She's raising their six-year-old daughter. She's also juggling the $4,600 monthly cost of the retirement home, along with her regular household expenses. The man's priority for a bed minister recently increased when he was physically attacked by another resident in his retirement home. So, Mr. Speaker, Question. the government's neglect of long-term care is appalling. Can the minister explain why her government has failed to build the necessary long-term care beds to keep up with our aging population? Thank you. And that's precisely what we're doing. Since 2003, we've opened over 10,000 wow. new long-term wow. care that's beds amazing. and that's redeveloped amazing. over 13,500. We know that. Minister. And we've certainly heard from communities about the need for additional beds, and so we will be supporting our growing and aging population. Uh, we put together our action plan for seniors, and we're responding to our seniors' growing needs. And that's precisely why we are creating 5,000 new long-term care beds over the next four years. Uh, the first yes, uh, phase of those uh, long-term care beds, uh, the applications are being reviewed. The proposal uh, time limit is coming up very shortly, and announcements will be made in the very near future. We Thank are you. doing exactly what the... Only New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Since December, I have been advocating for the reunification of Patricia and Don Dayton. They have been married for 64 years but are being forced to live apart without each other because of Ontario's broken long term care system. In fact, when I can, every Friday, I've been driving Don to see Patricia. Uh, they are a loving couple and they miss each other. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health claims that a new reunification regulation has solved the problem, but the Daytons are still separated. In fact, Patricia's Lynn care worker has asked 387 residents to switch homes and make space for Dawn, but the list has been exhausted, and there is no hope for reunification in sight. And This is completely unacceptable. Can the, acting, uh, can the Minister of Health explain— Question. Why this Liberal government is saying that there is no longer a problem with couple reunification in our long-term care homes when Don and Patricia are still Thank you. living apart. Thank you, Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, and certainly stories uh, as uh, illustrated by the member opposite really touch us all. And uh, I think we all understand very clearly the need for spouses to continue to live together uh, whenever um, we can support them in that in that goal. And uh, we know it's really important for families and for the emotional support that uh, they need from each other. And so our government has been giving a very high priority to residents who are seeking to be reunited with a spouse or partner. And we're taking a number of steps to ensure this process is as smooth as possible for families. Now, we do know that there's more that we can do, and we recently made changes that designate a number of reunification priority access beds in every long-term care home. These beds will help to address delays in reunification for those in crisis to be reunified with their loved ones in a long-term care. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Again to the Minister of Health. The MPP for Nickel Belt has been trying to reunite 91-year-old Gottfried Adler and his 88-year-old wife Hildegard as well. The Adlers have been separated for over six months after 67 years of marriage. Terrible. Like the Daytons, the Adlers are emotionally distressed because of their separation. Ontario seniors shouldn't have to settle for a long-term care system that repeatedly breaks promises and hearts. <laughs> Will the Minister of Health direct her ministry to reunite the Daytons and the Adlers today? I am asking for your direct intervention to help Thank these you. families. You say that, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would certainly uh, say to all members of this House, if one is aware of a particular situation in one's constituency, please feel very free to approach me to draw my attention to that particular yeah. item. I have operated like this since being the Minister of Community and Social Services, because sometimes there is a solution that can be found yeah. more readily. But as a systemic issue, uh, going back to the fact that we do have reunification priority access beds, we do encourage families to work with their local uh, Lynn partners to ensure that seniors do have access to the care that they need and the best quality of life in their later years. And we are responding to the needs of our growing and aging population. I've mentioned the number of beds that we are increasing over the next uh, short time, and uh, we will continue to work in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. New question, the member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is not for the new Minister of Health, but for the Minister of Education. Ontario is now an international leader in education, thanks in part to our historic investments in building new schools. In my riding of Kingston and the Islands, we have recently opened two new schools, Molly Brandt Elementary School and, just last fall, St. Francis of Assisi Catholic School. It's a state-of-the-art building. It's designed with a beautiful open concept and many collaborative spaces. Mr. Speaker, our government recently announced a number of new investments that will bring new and improved schools to students and communities across Ontario. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is our government doing to build on historic improvements and investments to ensure that students are learning in new and improved schools that support student achievement, Question. equity, and well-being. Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, giving our kids the best possible start in life is one of the most important things we can do as a government. That's why I'm proud of the strong investments our government has made in education. In fact, no government in the history of this province has invested more in building and expanding Ontario's publicly funded education system. That's because we know that investing in our schools is about more than bricks and mortar. Building better schools builds better learning for our students. That's why we've made a historic investment of more than $18 billion since 2003 in schools, building more than 860 new schools and more than 840 additions and improvements across Ontario. Just
Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, these investments in modern learning environments ensure Answer. that our students are on a strong path to success. Thank you. Supplementary. We are extremely proud of the investments made in Ontario's publicly funded education system, and we know that giving students the best possible learning environment, high quality and modern buildings is part of our plan to grow the economy, create jobs and bring fairness and opportunity to the people of Ontario. The French community in Kingston and surrounding areas is growing and our government is doing more to support that growth. Recently, I had the honour of making a very special announcement in my riding. This was an announcement that I was very proud of. I was very proud to see everyone get together and work together with such an attention for our students. announced $784 million to build, expand and Here's renovate 79 schools across the province. Minister, can you please tell us more about the project in Kingston and how we are providing student achievement with investments in new and improved school facilities? Merci. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the member from Kingston for this important question. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to supporting school boards by providing modern learning environments for our students because we know these spaces put our kids on a path to success. That's why we recently announced $24 million for the construction of new joint use facilities for Ecole Secondaire Publique Mille Ile and Ecole Secondaire Catholique Marie Rivière. C'était une annonce où I was very happy to see everyone work together for the interests of our students. Not only build schools, but also build communities. This new facility includes 49 childcare spaces and will accommodate 600 students. This total capital investment will support more than 46,000 students with the learning spaces Answer. they need to thrive. These investments in new schools support student achievement, fairness, and opportunity. New question. Member from Chiche Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Let me first off congratulate you on your new position. I believe you do find yourself in an unenviable position given the challenges within your ministry, especially those in long-term care. I want to speak to you specifically about those challenges as they relate to Sault Ste. Marie. Currently in Sault Ste. Marie, we have over 1,000 people in long-term care beds, and there's about 700 people on waiting lists waiting upwards of three years to secure a long-term care bed. Our lo local hospitals are uh, constantly op operating over capacity, and they lack the, the, the resources and the space to be able to keep up with the demand. To say that our long-term care situation is reaching a breaking point would be an understatement. Recently, the CAO of our local hospital, Ron Gagnon, indicated that we need 750 new beds in Sault Ste. Marie now in order Question. to meet our future and current demand. My question is, will you commit to building these beds immediately in Sault Ste. Marie? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as we have announced, we will be opening 5,000 new long-term care beds over the next four years. And uh, we have now opened the call for applications to understand the needs at the community level to determine where the new beds should be allocated. And we certainly intend to continue to actively engage in further consultation with the public, long-term care home providers and placement coordinators to establish a long-term plan to meet the growing and changing needs of Ontario's seniors, no matter where they are. We have uh, recently announced uh, um, just before Christmas, we announced 50 new long-term care beds in London and an additional Answer. 128 new beds for the Havelock community. Havelock. We are listening to communities and we're opening beds where they're needed. Thank you. Great. Supplementary. The member from Halliburton, Porthal, Lakes, Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Congratulations on your new post. For years, long-term care capacity issues have been one of my constituents' biggest concerns. That's because Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock has the highest ratio of need to available beds in Ontario. 
There are currently 2,169 people on the wait list for long-term care beds in my riding, and on any given day, 30 to 40 percent of local hospital beds are occupied by people who should be receiving care in long-term care homes. This government is failing our seniors, Mr. Speaker. It's unacceptable that our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents waiting years to get the care they so desperately need. So my question to the minister is, how does she explain this government's failure on this file question. to the more than 2,000 people waiting for long-term care beds in my riding? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And of course, uh, we are addressing the capacity challenges uh, that the member opposite is referencing. And we are aware of different demographics in different communities. And certainly, this is why this call for applications is uh, being looked at so closely to make sure that we match um, the new beds with uh, the need in the community. As she referenced uh, some of the issues around hospital overcrowding as well. So I do want to remind her that we have created 503 transitional care spaces outside of, outside of hospital for up to 1,700 patients who don't require care in a hospital. So we're trying to address each piece of this uh, issue of capacity, and yes, I believe that we're going in exactly the right direction. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, the mental health unit at London Health Sciences Centre has been overcrowded for years, and it's getting worse, not better. Psychiatric beds have been forced to operate at 140, 150, even 165 per cent occupancy day after day, which is far above the safe occupancy rate of 85 per cent. Now we've learned that 10 new psychiatric beds will finally be added, but the beds won't come with funding for new doctors or health care workers to care for patients. Speaker, adding beds without adding staff will not fix the overcrowding crisis. It will only make the problems yeah. worse. Why is this Liberal government refusing to fund both the beds that are needed and the appropriate staff for mental health patients in London? Thank you. Minister of Health, long -term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and certainly. Uh, uh, the member opposite has referenced an issue that I think uh, we all acknowledge is extremely important. That's the care of those with mental health issues, addictions issues. And as a former member of the Select Committee on Mental Health and Addictions, I certainly uh, would like to see as much as we can possibly do to address this particular area. But our government certainly has been making <coughs> Uh, major investments in this particular area. I'm so very proud to be part of a government that has increased mental health spending every year. We've now committed to putting forward more than $1.9 billion over the next 10 years. We've been building on our mental health strategy, open minds, healthy minds, and we've been taking immediate Answer. action on recent recommendations made by Ontario's Mental Health and Addictions Leadership Advisory Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, since, since this Premier came to office in 2013, London Health Sciences Centre has seen $141 million cut from its budget. That's the equivalent of nearly five 500 full-time health care workers. As a result, we've seen chronic hospital overcrowding, especially for mental health beds, and not enough staff to care for patients. Currently, the hospital is staffed for 71 psychiatric beds, but there are 28 extra beds in operation every day. There are mental health patients lining the emergency room hallway on a daily basis, waiting for a bed. It's gotten so bad that people in mental health crisis who should be in hospital won't go to the ER for the help they need. Why is this Liberal government refusing to fix the hospital overcrowding crisis that Liberal cuts have created Question. in London? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> And I have just been informed that apparently five psychiatrists and one nurse practitioner are being hired now at the London Health Science Centre. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Checkmate. And to continue on the number of investments that we're making, we're developing a province-wide, publicly funded, structured psychotherapy program that will help people with things like mood disorders, anxiety and depression, and other supports to manage their needs. And we will be the first province in Canada to do this. We're creating, along with the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, Answer. a network of integrated youth service hubs that will provide one-stop access to mental health services, as well as other health peer-to-peer -peer employment you. and housing support. Thank you. Question, the member from London North Centre. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. And my question also is not for our superstar Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. It is. It is for the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Uh, speaker, our government is committed to creating fairness and opportunities for all Ontarians. However, barriers to economic participation and continuing inequality in income and employment rates are major challenges for Indigenous peoples in Ontario, particularly in Northern Ontario. Over the past 15 years, Liberal governments have taken many actions in close collaboration with our Indigenous partners to drive economic development and build a better future for Indigenous communities after years of inaction, neglect and worse under the Harris Conservatives. Can the minister tell us more about how our government Question. is supporting Indigenous communities to fully participate in our economy? Thank you. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, since 2008, we have provided $136 million through our new relationship fund to close the socioeconomic gap and support Indigenous economic participation, including nearly $25 million for First Nation in Kiwitanung, our $95 million Indigenous Economic Development Fund, which the PCs voted against in 2014. <laughs> has provided $25 million in funding to date. It will provide another $70 million in additional funding over the next seven years. Okay. Our Indigenous Community Capital Grants Program has provided $34 million in funding to key infrastructure projects. And through our $650 million Aboriginal Loan Guarantee Program, a major initiative under the Green Energy Act, which the PCs say they will repeal, Answer. we have— we have continued to support meaningful participation in renewable energy projects for Indigenous communities in Ontario. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. Um, uh, the, the, the PCs say they support economic development for Indigenous communities, but actions speak louder than words. Speaker, the truth is they've consistently voted against the key investments we're making to support Ontario First Nations. Education is key to Indigenous economic development and, and to reconciliation, and it's a shame that the Conservatives voted against our landmark OSAP overhaul, which has helped drive a 35 per cent increase in one year, Speaker, a 35 per cent increase in the number of Indigenous students receiving OSAP over the past year. What's more, just this December, they voted against the historic $56 million investment in Indigenous institutes, allowing Indigenous learners to gain the skills Question. they need to be successful in the workplace. Speaker, can the minister tell us more about how our government, despite this lack of support, Thank you. is actively supporting? Thank you. Stick to policy. Minister. Speaker, the fact is the PCs have no real plan for Indigenous economic development. They voted against our Fair Hydro Plan and the First Nations Delivery Credit, which were commended by none other than Ontario Regional Chief Isidore Day as an important step to reduce poverty and support economic development. They voted against our landmark $1 billion commitment to the Ring of Fire infrastructure in the Matawa Tribal Council area. Speaker, reconciliation is more than word. Finish, please. Speaker, it's about action. By voting against key actions we were taking, 
the PCs made it clear they are not with That's us on Ontario's journey towards reconciliation. Yeah. Billions in cuts are coming if the Thank PCs you. form the next government. New question. The member from Dufferin Calgary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Welcome to day one. I would like to share a heartbreaking story from a family in Dufferin Caledon who were struggling to find care for their father. 93-year-old dad from Bell Fountain, he was forced to go to London three hours away to find a long-term care placement, three hours away from friends and family. To quote his daughter, something needs to be done to help the seniors of Ontario to live out the rest of their lives in dignity in a facility that is able to deal with their needs. Why is this government failing to provide the care that Ontario seniors deserve? Thank you, Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you very care. much, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, when we hear of stories, uh, uh, as the member of Dufferin Caledon has related, uh, uh, we're obviously extremely sympathetic, and we know that we uh, need to ensure that uh, people live out their lives in uh, dignity and in safety. And that's precisely why we have announced the addition of some 5,000 more long-term care beds over the next four years. And this is uh, something that uh, will be tailored to individual communities through the application process. Uh, the first tranche of this <coughs> is coming to a conclusion very, very shortly. And uh, I would simply say to the member opposite that uh, we are doing exactly Answer. what I think she is uh, intending for her constituents to have access to the kind of care that Thank they you. require. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. The member for Whitby Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. According to the Ontario Ministry of Finance, the number of senior speakers is expected to more than double by 2036. 200,000 seniors alone in Durham Region. Speaker, the Central East Local Health Integration Network, which includes the region of Durham, has the highest number of patients waiting for long-term care placement in Ontario. Thousands and thousands of men and women waiting. Clearly, the Liberal government isn't meeting the long-term care needs of thousands of seniors in the region of Durham. Speaker, will the Liberal government commit today to address the long-term care crisis in the region of Durham? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, yes, the demographics of individual areas is certainly a subject uh, of study. I know under a former Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, MPP, uh, uh, Deb Matthews, this was an area of intense concentration, and that's precisely why we have issued the application process in the way that we have, so that we can ensure that the beds go where they are needed to go. We are making substantial investments. Just to reiterate, we've doubled the funding for long-term care over the uh, length of our uh, mandate. And we will continue to work. We know there is more to do. And uh, I look forward to uh, being able to make an announcement uh, uh, in the near future as to the successful Answer. beds. Thank you, Mr. Answer. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, we received further confirmation that Ontario's $23.1 billion GO expansion program has been reduced to little more than a Liberal re-election scheme. We already had evidence that the former Minister of Transportation intervened after Metrolinx rejected a proposed new station in his riding. Yesterday, we found out Order. that another rejected station, this time in the riding of the Minister of Housing, is suddenly back on the table. Meanwhile, go riders of from Toronto come to order. who use existing stations are getting their promised service frequencies. Stop the clock. Minister of Economic Development and Growth, second time. Should be. I believe you finished your question. You have more? You will uh, have a wrap up, please. Why is the Premier putting regional express rail at risk 
just to serve the short-term political interests of the Liberal Party. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. But MetroLink's board of directors approved the addition of 12 new GO stations in June 2016. As they've stated, this decision comes as a result of initial, initial business case analysis, extensive consultation with municipal and regional representatives, community engagement, and collaboration between the Ministry of Transportation and MetroLink on wider regional transit and transportation plans. All proposed new stations require additional technical and planning analysis, which has been made very clear. Metrolinks has done substantial work on their business case analysis methodology. They've now committed to posting business cases prior to board decisions for all new GO stations. The business cases and recommendations still need to be approved by Metrolinks board yes, of sir. directors on March 8th. I look forward to seeing the results of their deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. The estimated costs of new GO stations have skyrocketed, coincident with the decision to procure RER via public-private partnerships. Not only is the Premier using Metrolinks to help re-elect her ministers, she's also offering up billions in public dollars to private investors while delivering less service to riders. Toronto Area Transit has been in a permanent state of chaos since the Premier when she was transportation minister, agreed to rip up Transit City and the big move, and as Premier has allowed her ministers to rewrite evidence-based transit plans to suit their own political needs. How can the Premier expect the public to trust the government to invest transit dollars wisely when she keeps putting her political ambitions ahead of the public interest? Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to uh, express that uh, our government's making the single largest investment in Ontario's history, much of which the NDP party has voted against. As part of this investment, we're continuing to move forward with one of the largest transit builds in the world today. Through our $31.5 billion Moving Ontario Forward plan, we're investing $13.5 billion in GO Regional Express Rail to increase the transit ridership, reduce travel times, manage congestion, connect people to jobs, and improve the economy, all of which the uh, people across the way have voted against. This is part of our $21.3 billion transformation of the GO Rail network making it the largest commuter rail program in Canada. We continue to work very closely with Metrolinx to bring regional express rail to the GO Rail network. We will uh, hope to have the support of the opposition members in order to provide transit to the people of Ontario. Thank you. No questions. The member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for the anti-racism directorate. Now, last Thursday, Speaker, I co-hosted a meeting, a town hall about racism in my community with my MP colleague, Nathaniel Erskine Smith. The minister responsible for the anti-racism directorate was in attendance, as was MP Ikra Khalid, who talked a bit about what the federal initiatives going on to fight racism in our communities. We had approximately 200 people attend to discuss this very important issue. And conversations, as we know about racism, are often very difficult to have. At this particular meeting, the conversations got quite heated at times. The me meeting was continually disrupted by a vocal few who questioned whether anti-racism existed and was necessary or a strategy was necessary or warranted. So public discourse is difficult, Speaker, but I want to raise this issue in the House because I think it's important for all of us to engage in a conversation Question. to better understand what happened. I represent a great area of Beaches East York, and I wonder if the minister could please initiate a dialogue with us here today about racism. Thank you, Minister Responsible yes. for uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to just take a, a quick second to thank the member from Beaches East York for hosting the town hall. In fact, I believe yeah. it was the first uh, town hall uh, hosted by an individual MPP here in Ontario, uh, specifically where I was invited to uh, to speak about racism. And it is a difficult situation. You know, these types of conversations can get um, emotional, uh, often ugly. Um, but it is a conversation that we need to have in Ontario because, like I always say, there is a cost to standing still. 
If we don't do something about racism today, it will continue to erode uh, our, uh, our values here in the province of Ontario. And I want to thank the member for having the courage to have that conversation well, in his riding. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, just uh, under two years ago, we started the Anti-Racism Directorate, and it was the Premier's commitment to look for ways to fight systemic racism here in Ontario. Yes, sir. And in the supplement, I'd like to talk about some of the accomplishments we've been able to, uh, to accomplish. Can supplement it. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister as well for attending. His presence at that meeting was such a calming influence that would have become a very heated situation. He is to be commended for the incredible work he's doing with the Directorate and, and bringing these issues to light in Ontario. These meetings are extremely important. At the Town Hall, we heard very real concerns expressed about carding, corrections issues, racial disparity in jury selection, appointments processes, identity-based data collection, and First Nations child welfare. In Ontario alone, we have people from over 200 nations who speak over 130 different languages. And with immigration driving population growth and racialized people making up a significant portion of our new population, it's essential for us to be ready and to be inclusive in Ontario. The conversations must continue, and we need to work relentlessly to take what we learn from the people of Ontario and Our put sir. it into tangible acts, uh, action. So, Speaker, could the minister please elaborate more on what the uh, Secretary and others are doing? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, thank you for the question. Um, the Anti-Racism Directorate, over the last two years, has established the directorate. We've moved forward with legislation to back up the directorate. In addition to that, uh, we've held a conference, developed a three-year strategic plan, and we've had conversations conversations right across the province. And uh, later uh, this uh, year, we will do an awareness campaign to fight systemic racism here in Ontario. But let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about systemic racism, we know that there are thousands of people across this province that are affected by racism every single day. And there's a moral imperative to fight that, uh, to fight racism, but there's also an economic argument to be made. If we don't um, utilize our full potential as a province to ensure that people can reach their full potential without barriers. It, is not, it not only affects uh, racialized people, but it affects all of us here in this room and all of us across this province. Answer. Being the economic engine of this country, it affects Canada. So we need to continue to band together because there's more of us. Thank, than you. The Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Welcome. Uh, Minister, last Friday I visited with the residents and staff of Afton Park Long-Term Care Home in Sarnia to discuss the state of long-term care in our community. In Sarnia and across the Erie St. Clair Lynn, there are more than 600 seniors on waiting lists for long-term care. There are 124 seniors waiting for a space <coughs> at Afton Park alone. Many on that list will be forced to wait over 500 days for a basic bed. Minister, once someone gets a space, they quickly realize that the staff are run off their feet trying to keep up with the workload. I hear this at my office on a regular basis. In Sarnia-Lampton, <coughs> the demand for more beds and proper staffing levels is becoming an urgent matter. Minister, will you commit to creating beds and improving staffing levels in all of Sarnia-Lampton's long-term care homes? Good question, Bob. Thank you. Minister of Health, long-term care. Uh, for a minute there, I was feeling somewhat neglected. Uh, <laughs> I would like to uh, reassure the member from Sarnia that uh, we will be opening new beds. We'll be looking very carefully at each community across the province. We will continue to support the work that our frontline care workers do each and every day. And uh, uh, I look forward to being able to make some announcements on the new beds in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, on a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, midway through question period, I just want to uh, introduce Steve Black, the mayor of Timmins, who came in midway through uh, question period. He's down for the Ontario Good Roads uh, Association Conference. Welcome to Queen's Park, Steve. Minister, uh, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today, as my ministerial statement, I'll be speaking and uh, giving recognition for Black History Month to uh, some early pioneers in hip-hop music here in Ontario, Cardinal Official, uh, Rascals, uh, Mishimi, who will be joining us here today, and I hope members can be here for that uh, ministerial statement.
hear that. <laughs> I'm hip. I'm hip. There are no deferred votes. Oh, I'm gonna quit. There are no deferred votes. This house stands recess till, till 3 p.m. this afternoon. Uh,